Yes. Okay. Hello to everyone. Friday morning, 10 o'clock. History matters. And definitely so does coffee. Very glad you're here. As we have been for, I, I have just been informed by one of our wonderful key audience members, Carol Lee. Uh, this is our 80, I already forgot, 81st episode, I believe is what I just said, my historian brain. Um, but yes, it is the 81st episode, which every time, every Friday, I say that that's remarkable, and every Friday it is remarkable. Um, so anyway, welcome to this. Today we're going to talk about, and you folks have been asking me um, in a variety of ways uh, to do this over the months, uh, and I'm going to do a version of it this time, and that is talk a little bit about um, being a historian, but more important than that, um, how being a historian gets you to think about history. So my process and then and then what it teaches me. Um, and so hopefully that that is what I will accomplish this morning by talking about, as I said on Twitter, things that um, surprised me or schooled me or that really have stayed with me. But before I do any of that, I will now turn to my partner in crime, Matt, who will tell us the rules of the game. And good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's so good to see everybody. Um, this has been, <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, just a great community. And um, I love the inside jokes. I just want to say that before we get going. The inside jokes are so much fun. Um, rules of the game are as follows, which are pretty standard. If you've been here before, if this is your first time, then this will be a new you. Um, everybody else, get your bingo cards ready because there's probably some words I'm going to say that are the same, which includes, please use the chat. Uh, we, we encourage you to use the chat. We love hearing from you, love having uh, side conversations and links and all the great stuff that you put in. And of course, we do save the chats um, and those are posted on our Slack channel. Thank you to um, Reese et al. for making sure that that happens. Um, if you do have questions for Joanne, please put them in the Q&A. <clears throat> we like to take questions on the Q&A because it's a lot easier to not lose track of what who said what, and it helps me shape the conversation a little bit better. So please make sure that you have questions. Um, and I am renewing my threat because we've had so few questions. No, we've had actually really, really great questions lately. We've had really good questions. We've had fantastic questions lately. So can keep that up and um, you know keep me from hijacking the conversation as much as possible. And as always, if you like what we're doing here at the National Council for Christian Education, please join us on the web at www.nchteach.org. Uh, look around our site, click join, um, join any of our colloquia. We have, uh, we, we have our colloquia. We're now taking applications for, for the spring. Um, just uh, let you guys know, we have one in Seattle, one in Detroit, one in Nashville, um, and um, one at NASA. So it's going to be a pretty amazing wow. um, set. So please make sure you sign up for those. Those are all funded by our friends at the Library of Congress, part of a Technologies Impact in American History grant. Um, and then this, you can always follow us on the web to find out about any webinars or any other programming that we have. Um, our website, of course, is, is up, but also we are on social media at History Ed on Twitter. Um, and at History Ed actually on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, you know, uh, Joanne and I are also on Twitter um, and, uh, you know, it's always fun to join us there as well. So with that, I turn it back over to Joanne and we will have a great conversation today. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, okay. So um, I did think about this topic very late yesterday um, because I was so focused on trying to get ready for something live, which is, scary. However, um, in preparing for it this morning, as always, when I prepare for these episodes, um, I learned things uh, just in thinking about it. So what I want to talk about today is a kind of a number of different kinds of things. Um, in a couple cases, I want to talk about um, pieces of evidence that I found that in one way or another really, let's say, shook me, because that can have a lot of different meanings. Let me close chat here, because um, as always, I'll be tempted to check. There you go. Um, so, and, and in two or three cases, um, I've probably mentioned these pieces of evidence before. I'm going to mention them again anyway, because if I've mentioned them before, it's because I find them striking. However, some of what I'll be talking about, um, I definitely haven't discussed here um, before. 
Uh, so I've got a handful of documents. Um, I've got a descriptive account of something. Um, I've got an insight into a kind of source that you wouldn't expect to be useful in the way I've used it that really taught me something. And then I've got um, two kinds of, of evidence. I don't know, two things that, that taught me a lot. One of them um, is a piece of evidence I haven't used before um, by the wife of one of my members of Congress in my last book. And you'll hear why it's really striking. Um, and then the last thing I believe I'm gonna discuss, which I had forgotten that I had, I don't know what I was looking for this morning, but um, it's part of my account of shooting a dueling pistol, um, which is a very precise kind of learning experience. But um, I will mention that too. I, I actually was kind of thrilled that I had written this. It was, it was rather lengthy and I thought, oh, that, that, that 1998 or 97 or Joanne was <laughs> really smart. Anyway, okay, so let, let me get things rolling. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, and I know I've discussed this before, I think towards the beginning um, of History Matters, uh, I, I devoted an episode to it. I just wanna mention it because it still stands out to me. Um, it, I remember finding it and, and being, having, it, it was sort of a gut punch of reality and it, it, I don't want to say transformed my understanding of my last book, but it, so much of the work that I do and so much of the work that many historians do is grounded on understanding the ground level humanity and by humanity, I mean humanness of the people we're writing about, trying as best we can to see through their eyes, which we can't, um, but trying to at least understand something about their mindscape. Uh, and, and seeing what that can teach us. So kind of putting, pulling ourselves out of our heads and trying to see things from a different perspective. This document, um, and again, I won't go into great length here, but I, I, I can't, when I said, I'm gonna do this episode and talk about astonishing or stunning or surprising documents, the first thing I thought of was this. Um, it's a memo um, that was written by three members of Congress about Congress in the late, 1850s. Um, and I stumbled across it uh, in the papers of one of these three members of Congress. Um, it was not something I'd seen uh, mentioned before. It, it appears in a couple of books, but it isn't really highlighted. And I think I list them all in the footnotes of the book. These three members of Congress were members of the New Republican Party. And what this, this document is a memoranda that they wrote up in later years and then made three copies, they signed all three copies and they put them in their private papers as testimony. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so they were doing this really deliberately to create a record. Now, on the one hand, that means you have to think about what they're saying and how the fact that they're doing this for an audience, what that suggests. On the other hand, it tells you that this is something that meant something to them. And you'll hear from what I'm reading here, why it affected me so much. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit of it here. Um, During the two or three years preceding the outbreak of the slaveholders rebellion, the people of the free state suffered a deep humiliation because of the abuse heaped upon their representatives in both houses of Congress. This gross personal abuse was borne by many because the public sentiment of their section would have fallen with crushing severity upon them if they had resorted in the only manner in which it could be effectively met and stopped by the personal punishment of their insulters. And by that, they mean physical violence or a duel. Mr. William Seward was the especial object of these insults and being the admitted leader of the Republicans in the Senate, all men of spirit were insulted through him, which is really interesting. And they go on to note that Seward, um, they don't know whether it was it because of a philosophical serenity of temper or because he lacked physical courage, yikes. Um, he didn't really respond to the insults. Um, on one occasion, Robert Toombs indulged in such terrible and unjust denunciation of Seward and his followers that the undersigned, these three men, felt themselves forced to do something to vindicate themselves and their constituents. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and their constituents threatened through these means with a denial of equal representation in the Senate. We consulted long and anxiously and the result was a league by which we bound ourselves to resist any repetition of this conduct by challenge to fight. And then in the precise words of the compact, 
to carry the quarrel into a coffin. After the lapse of half a century, the statement of this arrangement may have the appearance of bloodthirstiness, but it should be remembered that the causes which led to it were extremely grievous. Our constituents were well nigh deprived of their representative rights in Congress by the insolence of our political opponents. Our very manhood was daily called in question. And then they go on to say they basically agreed that when this behavior happened again, they would prove themselves willing to duel and if required to die to defend their party, their cause, their principles, their constituents, their part of the union. So all of that in and of itself, as someone writing about um, something that hadn't been focused on before, which is the impact of threats and um, insults and violence in Congress, this testimony was remarkable. Um, and again, they're trying to, they're appealing to an audience in writing this, so they're trying to make it powerful. On the other hand, the fact that they did what they did, uh, and there is other evidence to show that they did indeed do what they're saying here, um, that's, that speaks pretty powerfully. The part that when I found this um, brought tears to my eyes is this. We have drawn up and signed this paper as an interesting incident for those who come after us to study, as an example of what it once cost to be in favor of liberty and to express such sentiments in the highest places of official life in the United States. So in essence, when I found this, what it felt like they were saying was, we've drawn this up for you. We've drawn this up for posterity. We've drawn this up so that people like you can read this and understand what it cost to fight slavery in these years before the Civil War. That's a remarkably powerful statement. You can see why when I thought of things that, that stunned me or surprised me, that's the first thing that came to mind. It, it, in and of itself, without that ending, it's powerful. It's the kind of um, personal testimony that you don't always get. Uh, and indeed, they, they buried them in their papers. And I think I found two of the three copies over the course of my research, but it's not like lots of people knew about it at the time. But what that reveals about these men, about that moment, um, about, most important to me in my book project, the impact of the behavior that I was writing about. So that you can't just say, ah, they're thrown around a lot of insults. Like, what's the big deal? Well, there was a big deal. There was a big deal personally, and even more significant, there was a big deal politically that because they were stifling themselves or silencing themselves or being afraid of provoking that kind of abuse, their constituents were being denied their representative rights, as they put it in that letter. That's just a remarkable piece of evidence. And that might stand out as one of the most um, powerful pieces of evidence that I found in the course of my research. I'm sure that after we finish this episode of History Matters, I will think of 18 others, but that one um, still stands out. Um, just the, the emotion of it. Um, so I, I have got a list of categories here, emotion, humanity, and, and how that leaps from that particular piece of evidence. Um, another category here that I've described is new factual evidence. Um, and again, I've talked about this here before, I will talk about it briefly, but um, it, it, it shows you a lot of things. Um, and this is the first hand account of the Burr Hamilton duel that I found on the bottom of a box at the New York Historical Society. Um, I mentioned that for several reasons. First, how can there be new facts <laughs> to be found about the Burr Hamilton duel, right? I mean, my students think this all the time when they're in my classes and I tell them they need to do a research topic and we look using primary evidence and they'll be coming to their own conclusions and they all say, um, how can I say anything new about anything in the founding period? And I, I talk about that at great length. This, I do not assume that they're all going to find brand new evidence, they, they can have, but they can have new insights in a variety of ways, comparing things in a different way, um, bringing different insights from having read different things into the questions they ask, databases that allow them to ask different kinds of questions. In this case, it was just a, a new document. Um, and the, the, the fates determined that the day I was, I was researching for my first book, chapter on the Burr-Hamilton duel, um, and I asked, there's a collection um, of sort of the, the papers collected um, surrounding Hamilton's, the, the duel and death of Hamilton. And most of them are 
Um, there's actually a list of things that, that Hamilton pulled together before the duel, and some of them are, are those, you know, like his will and his statement about his financial situation and his final statement about why he's fighting the duel. But um, normally they serve you that on microfilm, and I had seen it before on microfilm. I'd use the microfilm. Microfilm is a hard thing to research on, uh, particularly back in the old days when there were not wonderful, sophisticated microfilm readers. Um, and when I had used the microfilm, at the very end, there's a document that was really light, really hard to read, and dated 1805, and the duel was 1804. Um, I had not read that thing before on microfilm because I was researching the duel. I wasn't sure what it was. It was going to take a really long time to look at. I didn't need it for whatever I was doing. Anyway, on this particular occasion, they didn't find the microfilm, and so they gave me the box. First of all, I know I'm supposed to be jaded about historical evidence as a historian. I'm not. So when I get to handle the real document, when I get to see the actual artifact that comes from the time period, I still get a, a, an amazing charge and, and a kind of um, eerie sensation of connection by, by seeing that. So the same was true in this case, particularly with these documents that describe something rather dire. But the last document dated 1805 was, um, notes from Aaron Burr II, William Van Ness, um, during his trial for taking part in the duel. So he's tried for his participation and he sits there in the courtroom and notes down what witnesses are saying. So he is recording what the boatman who rode them across said, what the doctor who was on the dueling ground said. These were first person accounts of the Burr-Hamilton duel that, that had not been found and used before that you can imagine. I, I didn't know what to do with myself, you know? And then I, I didn't really necessarily trust that they hadn't been used before, but I, being someone who's studied Hamilton for a very long time, I had no memory of these things. And this does fall into the category that if someone had read it, they wouldn't understand, I think, why it's important because a lot of why it's important has to do with dueling. At any rate, I read these accounts. I sat there all day, I didn't eat. <laughs> I didn't take a restroom break. I just sat there. Um, and some of the things that in it were fascinating that I wouldn't know otherwise. And there's the one that made it into the Hamilton musical, which is when the doctor is testifying, he's asked, what did you see? And his answer, and these are all paraphrases, his answer is, um, I had my back to the, to the dueling ground. I, I actually didn't see anything. I heard gunshots, but I didn't see anything, which, Immediately, you know, I'd always said that there were so many rituals involved with dueling um, that are there for deniability. The, the duelists, particularly, they're all elite, leading political, for the most part, white men. They protect each other with these rituals. So David Hozak, the doctor, he's like, I didn't see anything, right? So he can't testify, but he says he heard gunshots. He's asked to talk about who he thinks fired first. And they describe, you know, going up to the dueling ground and sort of clearing the ground. Um, the boatman, one of the boatmen says, um, did you see any guns, I think? And he says, no, there, there was a bag. When I got into my boat, there was a bag and it looked like it had something heavy in it. I didn't see any guns. <laughs> it was a bag with the guns. Um, they're asked, I think, did, did you hear the word challenge, which it's illegal specifically to send a challenge. All of them are like, uh, no, no one said anything about a challenge. So what was remarkable about the document, first of all, is that it was new, but equally, if not more important, what it revealed about both the Burr-Hamilton duel and these rituals and why they were important and how they were used. And the document showed them doing exactly what they were supposed to do in play. As you can imagine, this was, um, that was a remarkable research moment for me. Um, and it, it ended up in the Hamilton musical without my advertising it. I realized it was there for the first time when I saw the show and then went up to Lin-Manuel Miranda and said, hey, that, that's my document, right? Um, but anyway, that, so that a, was a remarkable discovery, but it also shows there are new discoveries you can make. There, there are old pieces of evidence, this isn't one of them, from which you can have new kinds of insights of a very different kind. Related to that, another category that I have here is unexpected sources or sources used in unexpected ways. Um, over the course of my years of research, I find again and again and again, there are things that um, 
you assume are going to be one kind of record and are going to be useful in one kind of a way. And then you start reading them and you realize, oh, no, these are actually very deeply um, layered cultural evidence. These things have such cultural evidence in them, you just have to think a, a certain way. So for example, um, the, the early congressional record, the congressional globe and the other things that I was using for um, the first half of the 19th century, it's the congressional record, right? So um, it, it, it's different in format, but generally speaking, it's an account of what happens. So one would assume, and, and people have used it generally for this way, historians, right? What did they say about the debate um, over Kansas, Nebraska, or the tariff, right? And you read the debates and then you say, well, this was the debate. Well, I went to the congressional record, actually, initially not interested in that material at all. I wanted to understand how Congress worked. And what I got from reading it closely was an understanding of the pacing and the tone and the rituals and the assumptions about what was allowable or not allowable and the way people interacted um, and the rules, the really unspoken rules of how Congress worked. It was an amazing, the congressional record was an amazing piece of cultural evidence. And that is not what I expected to find. And um, I talk about that a lot and write about that a lot because um, it's a reminder, particularly in the case of culture, you could read a lot of different kinds of documents, but if you're thinking in a broader sense, if you're thinking, what does this tell me about that world? What can I tell about the people being described here? You can come away with really different insights. Two other things I'll just mention very briefly that do the same thing. Um, proceedings, trial proceedings. Um, very often, as with the um, Burr Hamilton dual document, people testify at trials if you're lucky enough to find either an account of a, a trial or they used to sometimes in controversial trials publish pamphlets describing what happened in that trial. Again, all kinds of um, throwaway comments that end up being really, really revealing. Um, congressional committee reports do the same thing right, committee report, you're hardly gonna think like, oh, well, that'll be wonderful cultural evidence. But I remember um, finding a committee report about um, one of my, the violent incidents that I write about in my book. And there are throwaway comments in it, like, and this is again, a paraphrase. There's one witness who says that, you know, so-and-so happened. Um, and then we jumped up on the desks to see it as we always do. <laughs> okay, now I didn't have that piece of evidence before. <laughs> And that was great, right? That was, and it wasn't to him important part of the testimony. He's talking to other members of Congress, right? It's like, well, you know, when fights happen, we jump on the desks. So anyway, there are all kinds of sources that can reveal things to you that you don't expect to find. Now, this brings us to um, the two, well, I'll mention two, I'm not gonna talk about them at all, but I have a, a category here called internal dialogue, um, documents that tell you something, uh, kind of as insightful as that first document I mentioned about the um, Republicans in Congress. I've mentioned both of these before and talked about them, so I won't do that here. But um, there's a document I've described before. It's actually the one I did an interpretive dance to. Um, uh, Hamilton's description of what a seal of the United States should look like, uh, and also Hamilton's conjectures on what he thinks will happen to the Constitution after the Constitutional Convention. In both cases, as far as I know, no one ever saw those besides him. So they're not public documents, but they show him musing about two really important things, right? What's going to happen now that we have a constitution? Uh, and what is he thinking as he leaves the constitutional convention? And what's the state of the United States? Like, what do I really think is going on now? And in both cases, it's mind blowing. Um, contingency began as a theme of this podcast with the, the seal, the national seal. Um, actually, no, with the conjectures on the Constitution. I take that back. Because um, Hamilton leaves the Constitutional Convention and then says, basically, I don't think this is going to work. Okay, you don't expect that. At any rate, I won't go into more detail. Both of those things, I will say, are available on um, the Founders Online database uh, through, oh, I can see right there in chat, Tim just posted the link. You guys are amazing. Um, they are available in the Founders Online um, database that is provided by the National Archives, which you, if you haven't found that yet, it's actually quite amazing, huge word searchable um, database of founding folk. Okay, these are the two last things I want to mention that are you haven't heard before. One of them um, is a document that I found. I was researching um, actually Lawrence Kitt, who is a South Carolina congressman who's involved in a number of violent incidents. So I was looking in Lawrence Kitt's papers. What I found was a letter from his wife 
to her brother. Now, Lawrence Kitt, he he was a little wild and crazy. He was very ready to use violence. During the caning of Sumner, Charles Sumner, he stood next to Preston Brooks to keep people from interrupting, right, with a, with a cane, I believe, to keep so that he the, the caning could take place. He's a real extremist. So here's a letter from his wife, Susanna, uh, I think Sue is what Kit almost always calls her, to her brother, Alex. Oh, Alex, and it's 1855. So Nathaniel Banks, a Republican, um, has just been made speaker, first Republican anti-slavery speaker. This is the response. My dear brother, oh, Alex, we are having frightful times here. War any moment and no knowing who may fall. Mr. Pryor, Klingman, and Mann have just left the parlor, decrying that all hope for a Democratic speaker is gone and that the Southerners are resolved a Black Republican, meaning an anti-slavery Republican, shall not take the chair. They are armed and determined to fight to the knife on the floor of Congress and either take possession of the Capitol or fall. Governor Wise in Virginia has 10,000 men drilled and armed that would march to the Capitol at the first sound of war. Oh, Alex, I'm so uneasy I can write no more. Mr. Kitt, her husband, has gone with them off to a caucus at Mr. Pryor's. What they will determine on, I don't know. I begged Mr. Mann to go with them to try and quiet them. The house is now in session. What they are doing even at this moment, there is no telling. I am nervous and excited so I can hardly keep my seat. You can't imagine the state of feeling here. Bowie knives and revolvers are the companions of every Southern member. These are fearful times and gloom and the most painful suspense and expectation prevail over the city. Heaven help us all. Okay, that's again, remarkable document that sitting here preparing for the episode, I was like, remarkable documents. Oh, there's the letter in which this woman says, my husband just left here with a knife and he wants to attack uh, Congress so that there won't be a Republican speaker. What an amazing document that is. Right. And I'll, I'll point out, first of all, it's 1855. Sumner hasn't even been caned yet. Right. And, and this this feels that extreme at, at that moment. That's pretty remarkable. But what she's describing as a woman and a wife and what it felt like and how scared she is and how she is witnessing this going on. And she's trying. She tries to intercede by sending a man into it, a man who can sort of calm people down. That's that also falls into the category of, wow, like that's a voice. I wrote here in the, the category, typically unheard voices. That's not a voice I got to hear from, that kind of voice very often in my research. It's a really powerful voice. Okay, last thing I'll mention, and then I do want to open things up um, for questions. And, and this is um, falls into the category of real life experience. Um, at some point when I was working um, on uh, my first book, uh, Affairs of Honor, and I was working on understanding the Burr-Hamilton duel, I decided that I needed to shoot a black powder dueling pistol. I needed to understand what that was like. And um, a friend of mine, a historian, um, had access, I, I think even he might've even owned um, a black powder dueling pistol. Um, and he had a friend in a Connecticut police department who had access to a police firing range and wanted to take part in this historical experiment. So, um, we set up, uh, I think this might have been 1998. I actually didn't bad me, did not write down the date. But at any rate, um, I, I wrote a, a long account of what it felt like um, to shoot that dueling pistol. And it was, it was informative on a bunch of levels. You'll hear, I'll mention one in a moment that one could um, hardly expect. And then it got reinforced during another uh, sort of reenactment moment. But at any rate, um, shooting a dueling pistol, you know, it sounds a little wacky. What can you possibly learn? But um, I, let me describe one of the things um, that I learned here. Towards the end, this is from the original document. Towards the end of our time shooting, I realized that during the many times that I shot the pistol, perhaps five or six, I had absolutely no, recollect, no recollection of the precise moment of aiming and pulling the trigger. I was not in that moment. I could remember lifting the gun and then felt the force of the shot and saw the smoke in the wake of the fire. It was as though my brain turned off in the moment of shooting the gun. 
I was anticipating the noise, the orange burst, the smoke, the power of the force, the slight fear of a misfire in case of which I was instructed. I was to hold the pis pistol facing towards the target, waiting for it to go off. It could go off as much as a minute after pulling the trigger, depending on when the powder decided to ignite. The mindlessness, the imposed mindlessness of the moment of shooting was odd. So during one of my last shots, I decided to deliberately try to avoid it. I stood with the gun aimed for a moment. I thought to myself, there is my opponent. He is raising his gun. We will both fire. I have to aim to at him to protect myself. I may die, he may die. In other words, I tried to anchor myself in the moment in the way that a duelist may have. But even with this deliberate effort, I found my brain turning off, the gun going off, and my awareness and returning, and, and my awareness not returning until I felt the force of the gun and saw the smoke. I thought of Burr, who referred after the duel to what he called, quote, the agitation and absence of mind that he felt, the quote, want of su sufficient presence of mind to have observed anything when he shot that pistol. Absence of mind is a great way of describing the feeling one has just before pulling the trigger. I can't say if this is common. I can't say, and I'm sure that many people have no absence of mind at all, but I know what I felt. And I remembered Burr's words that he just, at that moment, his mind just wasn't anchored in the moment. Years later, I was at a reenactment of um, the Burr Hamilton duel. Uh, and the fellow playing Burr second, William Van Ness, um, I mentioned to him that I'd shot this dueling pistol and that my mind had gone blank when I pulled the trigger. He had fought in Vietnam. And he said that was very common, actually, that 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 was something that happened on the field of combat, that you're present and then you pull the trigger and you're suddenly kind of not there. So um, that was that was really instructive. Um, I won't, there's a passage here that I won't read because I want to leave time for questions. I'll just sort of touch on parts of it. Um, at the very end of, the, of our session, our firing session, um, I was given the chance to shoot a police revolver. Um, and uh, I was handed the pistol. Um, I did exactly what I was told, to stand the way I was told and lined up the gun to the way I was told. Um, and when I pulled the figure, the, the, the trigger here, I'll read this little sentence. I then pulled the trigger and the force of the sh shot pushed my arm up over my head. The force was amazing, frightening. It was truly an explosion bursting away from my hand. The dueling pistol felt like nothing in comparison. This was much harder to remain detached from. Um, and at the end, there are two statements here, and I'm, I'm going to read them both, although I'm a little bit mortified by one of them, but I'm going to read them both. The idea of aiming something of that force at another person, or worse, being hit by a bullet from it, is too much to imagine. That I expected to see. What I didn't expect was what I wrote at the end of this account. I have to confess, that on a certain level, shooting was a great thrill. It really gives you a charge, a rush of power. I enjoyed it, I have to confess, I enjoyed it. I don't like that sentence, but it, it's pretty remarkable that it's there. The last thing I'll close with here, from the meaningful and the significant to the absurd, um, I said on a tweet this morning uh, from Newbie uh, that I had laughed out loud in preparing for this episode. This is what um, made me laugh out loud. I found the, an account of me um, being there for a reenactment of the Burr-Hamilton duel, and I, I recorded everything that happened, including <laughs> the reenactors individually asking for my phone number. <laughs> I recorded being hit on by Burr and Hamilton. I knew it had happened. I've talked about it before. <laughs> I recorded evidence of it. And I said in my account, like, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was embarrassed, so I gave my phone number to Dr. Hozak too, as though I was just like, here, everyone, have my phone number. Although Hamilton said he's gonna call me. <laughs> so, anyway, I have evidence of that and that in and of itself. You never know what kind of historical evidence someday will be useful. Okay, I will stop there. I've gone a little over. Um, I am getting the re reminder for the mug, which I will do. Um, hopefully that was um, useful. You know, it's weirdly personal, but I think, it is useful when historians talk about how they do what they do because it reminds you, and as I said in a tweet, um, part of what you're uncovering and clinging to is the humanity, the humanness of the moment you're writing about and the people you're writing about. And, and in a way, that's what all of that 
suggests. Okay, now the mug. Um, the mug, <laughs> uh, things that, so remember that we're starting with things that stunned me, surprised me, schooled me. Um, this, this is the many brains <laughs> of Dr. Joe Freeman. This is from Carolee. Um, and this has all of my brains in here that I mention here every week. Um, Non-historian, citizen brain, historian brain, popular culture brain, founder's brain, quote brain. I just thought this is the best way of referring to historians' greatest hits. Carolee, as always, thank you for this. Um, and, and on the back, there are different brain, they're, they're brain quotes for me. At any rate, um, I think this is pretty much, you can't get more apt than this for today's topic. So thank you, Carolee, for this mug. It's the first time I've had a reason to use it on History Matters. So, okay, Matt, now the background. The background, I have seen no guesses, um, but it, admittedly, this is not an easy one, oh. mostly because it wasn't easy for me to think of something this morning when I was, I was like, huh, okay. Um, yeah, somebody did say it's my new house in Michigan, I wish. Um, <laughs> Uh, this this particular home uh, it's no longer a home, but this home has 14 bedrooms, which my house very much does not. Wow. Uh, this this is uh, Undershaw in Surrey, which is the home of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and so today we were talking about evidence and um, things that stick with you, and um, and I couldn't think of a, a better representation of, of the detective work the historians do um, than, uh, than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the uh, uh, author of Sherlock Holmes. So that's what I went with. That's, that's excellent and not obvious. It's not the, the set from Friends or, <laughs> or Cheers or whatever. Or, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want you won't live that down. <laughs> hey, I'm okay with that. I, <laughs> well, we only have oh, 221B Baker Street. I should have done that. That's okay. Or, this is or Benedict Cumberbatch's house, which would have been even creepier. Um, all right. We only have four questions so far. So I over talked. So that's not. No, better. no, I, I don't think you did at all. But we have um, only four questions. So please put in more questions, or you are stuck with my questions and all that kind of good stuff. So Dave says, uh, how do the two of you and newbie the history bird, which historians, which historians, oh, besides the two of you and newbie the history bird, which historians do you recommend following on Twitter? Um, Kevin Cruz and Kevin Lada are two. Is there anybody else that you recommend following? Oh, gosh. Um, there are a lot. Um, one thing I will say to do, and this is how Kevin Cruz always answers when people ask him this question, he has created a list of historians that I believe he follows. Uh, and you can go to his list and there's a list. Oh, go away. Vox Media keeps beaming in here. Go away. Anyway, um, he has created a list on Twitter that you can access. Um, I don't know. There's so many. I mean, obviously, Heather Cox Richardson um, and actually, obviously, Carol Anderson. Um, who, I, I'm trying to think of others who I read all the time. Uh, let's see. My brain has just gone blank. Um, my brain has gone blank of last names, and that's bad. I'm not going to answer this because I'm going to either get the last name wrong or leave someone critical out. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I would say, yes, Karen Wolf, actually, Tom just mentioned that. Wonderful. J.L. Bell. These are all very good. Thank you for coming to my rescue, Tom. There are lots of people. I just, um, I'm having a... a Becky said, Gris Hayes. I know she means Gris Hayes, <laughs> but um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, stick with historians. There are a lot, um, there are a lot, uh, and I'm not gonna name them, but oh, here, did uh, I think, oh, and Nick Gordon-Reed for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think Annie, is that the link to Kevin's list? I think it is, because you guys instantly present, she thinks so, okay, yes it is. Okay, so there in the chat is, um, a link to Kevin's list, um, which is chock full of people who it's good to follow on Twitter. There are a lot of historians on Twitter and historian Twitter, uh, the, the Twitter historians. 
Um, that's a, they make a really good use of Twitter. Sometimes they're posting evidence. Sometimes they're engaged in really substantial conversations. There's one going on right now about um, judging the founders based on their um, thoughts or their actions and how many people do the former, but not the latter. Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, and it's historians debating with each other um, about it. So what that noise was, um, at any rate, uh, so, uh, and actually, Twitter historians is the hashtag. If you want to beam into those conversations, that's useful to know too. Um, yes, good. You guys are, are filling the need here um, of these people. These are all uh, people I, who I follow and read and could not think of uh, in the moment of crisis. So, okay. Um, okay, so uh, uh, is Heather Cox Richardson's letter from an American written for future historians? Footnotes seem to be a powerful pieces of factual evidence from Dave. I think they're, and I'm speaking as Joanne, um, I think they're written for the present and the future. I don't think they're just written for historians. I think historians will read them. Mm -hmm. But I think she's creating a chronicle of what's going on. And I think obviously over and over again, people attest to how she is decoding this moment and, and giving people an understanding of it in a way that they wouldn't otherwise have. And taken together, it will be an invaluable chronicle that um, anyone will want to read to understand what's going on, but that for sure historians will. Connie wants to know, did you ever find a source that really contradicted what a politician or founder was publicly espousing? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, for sure. Um, a really, my, yeah, no, they lie all the time. <laughs> what a surprise, yeah. Um, the, the, a totally minor one that comes to mind only because I said it out loud. I was doing research for my first book um, at Monticello and I was reading Jefferson letters and there was a new volume of the Jefferson papers that had just come out. So this is before databases. And there was like a new volume 1793 of the Jefferson papers had just come out. And I am one of the handful of geeks that was like, there's a new volume of the Jefferson. <laughs> So I was using it, and what I found in there, and the background here is, um, in 1793, there was, you know, what has become known as the Genet Affair, in which um, Citizen Genet supposedly claimed that he was going to go above the president's head to appeal to the American people to support France. This obviously became a huge thing, big deal, uh, and you know, just search anywhere on Janae Affair and you'll see the explosions it caused. So that's what I knew. And I also knew that Jefferson had said, that's not what he meant. That's really not what he meant. But what I found is a letter from Jefferson, I think to Madison. And if Jefferson writes to Madison, it's pretty trustworthy that what he's saying is probably true. And it said, you know what they're saying? Janae said, he said it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was at Monticello and I said out loud, He's lying. <laughs> All these people came over to look. I was like, no, really? Like he lied. He lied. Like he, and here he's admitting that he lied. And then I went back to look at the statement that he had written about what actually happened. And I and I saw the crossouts and the revisions. He was trying really hard to find a way to say it, what he that, that Janae said it without really quite saying that he said it, although the meaning of it was pretty clear. So that was just a blunt example. And I just remember it's it's not, on one hand, it's not really important. On the other hand, to see a blatant lie that way, mm -hmm. um, which is why I said out loud, he lied! <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the concern <laughs> of some of these Monticello people. <laughs> so anyway, it, 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 this was a long time ago. Um, but I still remember that because I, I was so surprised. I don't know why I was, but I was. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like getting to the climax of a really good novel when you like inadvertently <laughs> just speak out loud. Or even like, that's a bad ending. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, right? no way. Yeah, no, that you have to. Obviously, I, I talk out loud all the time to myself and others. So nothing <laughs> should be a surprise on that going. Um, you talked about students at this from Catherine. Um, good to have you back, Catherine. Uh, Joanne talked about students asking how they can write something new, quote unquote, uh, around the founding. And I'm curious how frequently new, uh, seen unknown evidence comes to light. Frequently, rarely, like how often, 
often does new happen? Well, so I can't answer that in any kind of definitive way. What I can say is there are different versions of new. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, that really means um, uncovering, oh, Gina is leaving, so I'm waving goodbye to Gina. Um, in some cases, that means literally finding um, a new piece of evidence that seemingly hasn't been recognized uh, by historians before. Uh, so that is new, new. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to have that happen a number of times in the course of my career, partly because I'm the person who reads every single piece of paper and goes to every archive and not everybody does that and it takes a long time, but I enjoy it, so I do it. Um, sometimes new is reading very closely. So um, the introduction to um, basically what ends up being Burr's memoirs, although he didn't author them, um, but the introduction, uh, in the introduction, the editor says that Burr um, he doesn't use this word, but dictated part of it to him. Uh, all of a sudden, what the contents of that book became different, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, it's like, it's not someone just writing a book that Burr was dictating to him. So that changed my interpretation of the book. And I don't think anyone, as far as I can tell, had found that before. That's always a risky thing to say, like you have to do a lot of digging. And even them, then you don't want to say this is entirely new. You want to say, I don't, think people have found it because as I tell my students, if you claim something is unique or brand new, you will always be wrong. <laughs> but um, there are some cases in which you know people know someone has not read something in the same way that you've read it. And that makes it new. Um, sometimes new, and I explain this to my students, means doing a comparison between two pamphlets or or two people or two events in a way that will reveal new things about those events or those people. Um, so there are all kinds of versions of, of new. New can be a really deep reading of one source, mm -hmm. um, like one pamphlet. Um, but as far as like finding brand new things, my um, assumption there is that there are, there's definitely more lurking out there. Um, I've never gone a very long time without finding something that either no one had recognized its importance before mm -hmm. or that had been sort of sitting in a weird box. Um, so... Uh, I'd say, you know, it's not uncommon. It's not common either. And I have in my mind a list of certain things that I know exist out there that I've read about, like I've seen a, like Jefferson noting something that he wrote. And as far as I can tell, it's never been found. And probably when it is found, it's just going to be a piece of paper with no, it's a, it's a little memo or jotting down of something. So um, it's not, might not have his name. It might not have any, annotation as to what it is, but I'll sure know what it is when I see it. And I know his handwriting. So mm -hmm. there's that's, you know, things end up in the wrong place or a weird place all the time. So, you know, this is part of why documentary papers projects, you know, publishing the papers of the founders, this is some of the remarkable work they do. They go all over the world looking all over the place for letters and documents that belong in those collections. And that's a search because let's say um, someone, in, a, a historical figure in the, the early national period is chatting with some other random person and says, you know, so-and-so just said this in a letter and hands the letter to rando guy. And it ends up in rando guy's papers. But no one will know it's there. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I found um, at one point an account, a verbal account um, of something having to do with the election of 1800, which was really fascinating and really revealing in the papers of someone who had nothing to do with the conversation. So you never know. And, and that's another way that um, sometimes new happens. And sometimes it's just a collection has not yet been fully processed, right? An archive has not had the time or, or staff to be able to fully process, in other words, really document what's in a collection. And for me, I'm always like, <laughs> like, now I don't know what I'll find. But that's another way in which there's stuff lurking out there um, that people don't necessarily yet know, or certainly historians don't know necessarily is lurking out there. Well, we were at the end of our questions, and then a couple more have come in, but I'm going to hijack the conversation anyway, because it's germane to what we were, you were just saying, okay. which is the, the question that I wanted let me rephrase this. The question that I was going to ask that I think probably a fair number of people want to know is, um, how do you know when you find something important? Um, in other words, when, you, hmm. when you're reading through these boxes and you find the rando guy or what, like, how do you know? 
Like, how, how do you, how, how are you like, oh, this is important. Like, yes, you, like you are trained and you can recognize Jefferson's handwriting and Hamilton's handwriting and things like that. But like, absent of that, like what, what does the average person need to know when they see something of importance? I'm checking here just to see if I am the original document and I didn't. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of answers to that. Um, mm -hmm. One, one answer, and you have to do research after this, but one thing that um, makes my antenna go up is it just if something like smacks me in the face as powerful, right? Mm -hmm. um, may not be new, but it might be important because I'm having a response. I always tell my students the, the age of Hamilton and Jefferson course that I teach, I'm teaching this semester, all based for the most part on primary materials. And I tell them, the students, when they're reading those documents, if you have a gut response, remember the gut response. It might not be precisely accurate, but it's gonna tell you something about the letter, which can be an entryway into it. So sometimes it's your response. Sometimes, and this is gonna be obvious, but I'll say it anyway, when you're really researching something and you've read a lot of scholarship about it, you kind of know what's floating around out there. Mm -hmm. So like me in the case of Hamilton, so that when I saw that document, I knew that of everything that I'd seen, I had not seen that. Um, so to me, new is really obvious in that way. Um, so I don't know if there's a trick to it. I think sometimes um, one way to be more likely to find something new is to do a really close reading. And by that, I mean, think about the words being used. Um, think about like, like when I was writing my first book and I was trying to understand what the election of 1800 felt like to people at the time. And I had an index card uh, I, I noticed that a lot of people were using the word anarchy and a lot of people were using the words civil war. So I created, as I was reading evidence, index cards, anarchy, civil war. And every time I saw a reference to one or the other, I listed it on these cards. And in the end, I had these lists of lots of times in which both of those things were mentioned. So I could say, oh, okay, so this is what it feels like. Probably nobody has done that before. I don't know. But in that case, it was just reading closely as I did with um, the Burr memoir, right? Mm -hmm. Reading really closely, thinking about the words, looking up words. Um, so, so I guess part of what I'm saying here is um, sometimes new is just looking at something differently. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, even obvious words have different meanings uh, in the past. I'm trying to remember I can't remember now what the precise word is, but there's at some point where I was reading someone's papers and there was, um, I, I, I did I, it was, I thought it was like a diary and I was reading it that way. And then I saw that the person used a different word. And when I looked up that word, it actually kind of shifted the meaning of what I was looking at. So, um, you know, this is all the stuff that uh, historians are trained to do, but that anyone can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just has to do with, um, asking yourself a lot of questions as you're reading the evidence. You know, one way in which I discovered I had something new to say about the election of 1800 was after days of researching, I actually stopped and said to myself, what did you not see? Like, mm -hmm. what did you expect to see? What did you not see? And I realized in that case, the answer was discussion of anything having to do with policy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's an important insight. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't think it's necessarily easy unless you're immersed in something to like see a docu document and be like new. Um, mm -hmm. But there are ways to kind of get a sense of that. Someone I just saw wrote, um, Catherine just, I don't know what it refers to. Is there an Eliza here? But here's another way in which you know new. And in this case, it was new stuff. Um, in the last few years, uh, there was a Sotheby's auction of Hamilton letters, mm -hmm. which of course I was all over that. And I had the opportunity, Sotheby's was nice enough to give me um, a day or two to just sit with the boxes and read what was in them. And there were a lot of letters from Elizabeth, Eliza Hamilton. Um, and I knew, you know, that it, maybe someone saw them and wrote about them. Probably not. This was in private hands. So there's a case in which I was looking at things and, and assuming whatever I was seeing there probably hasn't been seen by many people. Um, so again, sometimes it's just the circumstance um that and in if you want remind me in the after party um that episode involves uh, the closest i ever came to owning a hamilton document 
Um, yes, you've I'm told this story. story. I love that story. I won't tell it again. But anyway, that's that <laughs> moment. That I might have owned a Hamilton document. I saw it. I knew what it was. Nobody else knew what it was. And then I opened my big mouth <laughs> because I couldn't resist teaching about it. Like, you know what this really is? Like, Joanne, shut <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, one follow up to that that conversation from Jeannie, which is how much time do you spend with original documents when you're researching and how much is reading secondary sources? Um, I think every historian handles that differently. And I think different topics have different answers to that question. For me, um, I'm often so interested in getting at human reactions to things um, that I probably go into primary evidence earlier than some people might and um, stand back a little bit from scholarship before jumping in. Um, and that is because I, I don't want my response to the documents to be shaped by other scholars. Mm -hmm. um, so I give myself kind of a general sense of what people have said, but my close reading comes after. Uh, and, and then I emerge from like extended, probably too extended. You know, I remember um, my graduate advisor, Peter Onuf, um, said to me, way too often stop researching you can write now and i had it above my computer stop researching because i just i love it and i would just go on and on and on and on but um i totally lost track of where i was going what was i answering <laughs> Coffee how, much is, how much is uh, how much time do you spend with the documents that you're researching yeah so um right that's what i was going to talk about was in the case of my first book um I was reading all these letters and kind of trying to get a sense of what the fighting felt like in the 1790s. Mm -hmm. And no one had really written about it in that way before. So I kind of glanced at the, you know, secondary literature plunged into the primary stuff. At the end, I emerged and said, you know what? I don't think there were political parties in the 1790s and realized I was basically arguing against almost all of the scholarly literature. And Peter Onuf said to me, it's really good that you weren't immersed in scholarly literature in that case, because you never would have allowed yourself to make that conclusion, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a balancing act. You need to know and in, engage with what other scholars have said on a topic. Their insights are invaluable. The balance is um, how and when do you, do you do primary or secondary research? And for me, the weight is always on, on primary because my gut response is a huge part of my evidence database. And, and so I, I need to have that um, without the framing of somebody else in my head. Well, I, we have time for one more question. Uh, so I'm going to end with this question because I think it's a fantastic way to put it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about your response. Uh, oh. Becky, this is from Becky. Thank you for this question. Um, Joanne, do you ever feel a bit voyeuristic when you're <laughs> digging, when you go digging and follow some evidence down the proverbial rabbit hole? Do you ever feel voyeuristic? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, people say things without assuming people are going to be reading. You know, I mean, Adams or Jefferson or Hamilton writing to other politicians on some level assume that what they're writing might be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but the average person, you know, lesser folk, um, they don't necessarily assume that. And people say all kinds of things in letters. They say dirty things. They, they you know, Tell, tell you things about their sex lives you really didn't want to know. Um, they, you know, they, they talk about, I don't know, who they hate and, and who they love or what their deep feelings are about something to such an extent that you, you feel bad kind of knowing it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of, there are, so two things. There are a lot of times in which I feel voyeuristic about something and I feel, um, which is why I give my students a handout, which is titled A Quick and Dirty Guide to Reading Other People's Mail. <laughs> because, <laughs> I know right. what we do. Um, that's right. and, and, and that, you know, that's, there's a power in that. There's evidence in that that you can't find elsewhere. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. The other way in which I feel, I don't, voyeuristic isn't the right word, but unsettled by my viewpoint. Um, mm -hmm. This happened in the course of my last book. And I was following um, one particular member of Congress. Um, who was trouble, you know? So I had, I was following Henry Wise of Virginia closely because he was trouble and then he left. It's like, ah, like what's gonna happen to my book? And then I found a new guy. So I'm tracking the new guy and he's trouble. And I'm like, okay, well, he appears to be the designated bad guy uh, in Congress now, so I'll follow him. And then he disappeared. 
Uh, and I'm looking in the record, he's gone. I'm digging around, I can't figure out why he left. And I discover that um, he had a serious drinking problem. Mm -hmm. And um, on one night in the middle of a congressional session, he went to a bar, he paid for everyone's drinks, went to his room and killed himself. Yes. So I'm cheering on this guy like, yeah, do something else crazy. And then I discover he's an alcoholic who killed himself. And I just, I still feel guilty about that. Mm -hmm. It really stopped me short and, and reminded me um, in a way to be more voyeuristic, you know, to, to mm -hmm. think more about not just what I was finding, but what I was seeing, I guess. Um, that, that really threw me, took me aback and stopped me short. And I felt, I felt really bad about it. Still kind of do um, mm -hmm. for a long time. It, it reminded me to not just be cheering on the stuff that I thought was fun, but to be actually thinking about what I was seeing. Um, and that gets back at our, one of our themes today, right? This, that, that elicits in us the humanity of, of what we do as historians, right? right? Right, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a case in which I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that. Right. Um, and then I was uh, reminded, I think it was um, Polk. I think it was, he was friends with, this guy was friends, I think with President Polk. I think it's in Polk's diary or something that he mm -hmm. he talks about what happens. Anyway, um, anyway, no, you're totally right. That, yeah, uh, it's just, you, you, sometimes, and I don't know if it's true for you, but sometimes when I'm reading history, I get so caught up in what's happening, like it's a plot that I forget that these are real human beings. So, you know, you always have to do that self-check, right? There's, these are human beings. Oh, absolutely. Like what, know? what am I, it's another question you have to ask. What am I seeing because I'm me in this moment? And what am I not seeing because I'm me in this moment? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, you know, what, what am I blocking out? Yeah. One last thing before we sign off here, um, people are asking about the quick and dirty guide to reading other people's mail. Um, one thing I will say is that I, I, one of the collections of Hamilton's writings that I published, there's a big Library of America one, and then there's a smaller one called the Essential Hamilton Paperback. Um, the Quick and Dirty Guide is in that volume, uh, in the beginning of that volume to help people read the letters. Um, I'll see if I can find a copy and post it somewhere, but it's already floating around out there. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was putting the book together, one of the people producing it at, at Library of America said, that's the best thing in the book. <laughs> so. Uh, tells you questions to ask when you're reading other people's mail. So, okay. Okay. Hey. Well, I will. Uh, I will say thank you. I'll just say thank you to everybody for being here, and thank you for um, all of your participation, all your questions. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Joanne, again for your incredible commentary on um, all things historical and or present. Um, this is as you know, my, one of my favorite, my, the highlight of my week every week. And, and thank you for, for being here and sharing your ideas with us. It's, it's truly remarkable. So um, if you please follow us and get to know us at, at the Council for History Education, and we would love to, um, you know, share our insights with you as well. So turn it back um, over to Joanne and we'll, be, and we'll go to the after party. Thank you. Um, as always, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, for making the time for this, for doing good historical thinking, for doing um, good democratic thinking. Um, someone on Twitter, uh, recently a troll, said something to me about how well, the stuff that you do, it's just chatter. Um, and I didn't really respond, but my thought process was no, actually. Talking with people about the current situation, about politics, helping people and engaging with them to better understand what's going on right now that ain't chatter, folks. That's not chatter. So you are part of that. And you are doing that with each other. And you are doing that with me. And um, I value that part of why part of why I come back every week. The other part of why I come back every week is, as Matt said, this is just too much fun. Um, so at any rate, uh, we will see you next week uh, with another new topic. Uh, for those of you who are not going to stick around, um, I wish you a good week. For those of you who are going to stick around, um, the after party is going to start. Explanation, as always, of what the after party is. At this point, every episode, we stop recording so that we can have a little bit more free-flowing personal conversation. Uh, if you have beamed in through the um, website, the, the online link, nchetech.org slash conversations, just stay right where you are. And as I say every week, someone's got it on their bingo card. 
poof, you will be in the after party. Um, if you're on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and join us on nche.teach.org slash conversations. Um, hope you join us. If not, I will see you guys next week. Bye, folks. Now it's the poof time. Good voice.